Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series, made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. So thank you everyone for coming. I'm Michaela Hall, Assistant Director of the Library. Um, I want to thank all of those who put lots of hard work to make this program have to happen. Russell, Sue Tranner, and Susan Martin, Chair of the Library's Program Committee. This is our first large-scale Zoom program, so please be patient with us as this is new to us as well. Our Zoom account allows for 100 participants and we had over 100 register. Um, I just want to ask again, as I've been saying, please all participants keep your video and your mics off unless asked by myself or Russell to turn them on. This will just help to ensure that there's no sound interference or lag during the presentation. And if you have questions throughout the meeting, please type them in the chat, which I will be monitoring, and Russell will answer them during the Q&A. I am recording the program. Uh, all personal information, such as names of participants, will be edited out. We plan to put it on our YouTube channel just so that those who couldn't attend can view it in the future. And thank you again for joining us. And I will turn it over to Susan Martin, Chair of the Program Committee. Welcome, everybody. This is terrific. A hundred people and more on the waiting list. Anyway, uh, we're so happy you could join us. We are especially lucky today have, to have Russell Janishian with us giving a talk on, and in fact, it's our first Zoom library talk and it's going to be on marine art of yesterday and today. One of the nation's leading experts on marine art, Russell is going to give us a fascinating description of many of the wonderful paintings that he has in his large, large gallery here on Water Street. So when I first asked him if he'd be willing to do a Zoom talk and be our guinea pig first Zoom talk speaker, he said, sure, no problem. I can speak to two people or 200. So there you are, Russell. Let's get on with it. <laughs> all right, well, thanks, Susan. Thanks, Michaela. Thank the library. And thank you all for coming in out of the uh, sunshine on such a nice day to sit here. I hope I'll make it interesting enough for you. Uh, fortunately, um, there's a lot to talk about here. And I'm going to try to move along here, technologically speaking, without seeing you all. So we're coming up to the best hour um, after we finish here, which is cocktail hour, of course. And I'll try to get you there right on time. But I just want to talk to all the Swamp Yankees out there, because you all know what Swamp Yankee cocktail hour really was. You got your bluefish filet, put it in tin foil with tomatoes, onions, little tarragon maybe wrapped it up, put it in the dishwasher with the morning dishes, <clears throat> set the dishwasher going, sat down, poured a big stiff drink, no wine, that was for Europeans, right? Uh, and at the end of 45 minutes, you had a couple of drinks, your dishes were clean, and you pulled out the blue fish and it was perfectly poached. So if we do it right, we'll get you right on time to start that. I say when you look out over the field of marine art, you can easily feel totally overwhelmed, like this ship in this painting by John Chancellor, <clears throat> or hanging on for dear life awash in the sea, or hanging up in the rigging here, photographed by famous tall ship sailor Alan, Alan Billiers. <clears throat> but if, and you, if it gets really bad, you can feel like walking the plank. So if I do my job for you tonight, I'll help you get your bearings you can't and hopefully you it keep safely <laughs> into port in this case, uh, our town of Stony Brook, Connecticut. The 25 cent history of marine art goes like this. The Dutch dominated the seas in the 17th century, and then the English dominated the seas in the 18th century, and then America dominated the seas as it built its navy 
and the, and the tradition of marine art began in 17th century Holland, moved to 18th century Britain, and then in the 19th century to the States. Um, and what we're gonna do is see if we can cover four centuries in 45 minutes, show you some of the key figures uh, in, throughout history. It's a, it's a quick overview and then how we got to the present and show you the diversity of uh, what's happening today. It'd probably be hard to follow all the names, et cetera, but I would say perhaps one thing, <clears throat> and that is if you just look at the water in every painting I show you, I think you'll come away enlightened in some way that you realize that water, which is a very difficult subject to paint, can be painted in a myriad of different ways, but all of them convincing. It's a really a sort of a fascinating study. So here's a little painting of a guy checking out the water. So let's get going. 17th century Holland really, uh, it, marine art began as a form of documentation. You had the Protestant North fighting the Catholic South, which became Belgian and the Netherlands, and artists were documenting them. And lead among them, this is the granddaddy of them all, Hendrik Vroom. <clears throat> this is not a battle scene, of course, but it's significant because it shows the elector of Holland who married King James's daughter uh, arriving into port. And Vroom was the first guy to really get it right. In other words, the ships sat convincingly in the water, the flags and the waves and the wind were all blowing the, the right way. But what's significant about this painting is there was a lot of collaboration uh, between the Dutch and the English. Um, even at this period, Broome did a series of tapestries celebrating the 16th century defeat of the Spanish Armada, huge tapestries that hung in the Houses of Parliament until the Great uh, Fire in London of 1834. So there was a lot of back and forth already. Um, he had one pupil, Jan Porcellus, and what we see here is an element beginning to be added into marine art, and that is <clears throat> a ship in nature. And all these little subjects from a ship arriving to port, battle scenes to a ship in nature, the use of light and dark to create uh, intensity uh, are things that you'll see thematically show up as we go through history. But the thing about Porcellus was uh, not only uh, was he uh, a pupil of uh, Vroom's, but he also married Vroom's daughter. So to me, that said he got the client list, which pushed him ahead in the, uh, in the field. And in Holland, Simon de Vlieger was, was uh, considered the epitome of the Dutch super realist style. In this case, a couple of Dutch warships off really the port of Amsterdam. But he's also significant because it's believed that he was taught by the next artist, Willem van der Velde the Elder, and was the teacher of Willem van der Velde the Younger. And these guys are particularly significant because as the uh, Dutch and the English were fighting, and it was over trade routes, I mean, countries fight, fought then for the same reason we do today, economics and religion. And uh, they're not very much separated, it doesn't seem to me. But uh, they'd fight for a few years, take a break, regroup, fight for a couple more years, uh, take a break. And one of those breaks, 1672, King Charles II invited Dutch craftsmen and artists to move to England. And I'm not sure that anybody really knows why he did that, either to enrich English culture or decimate Dutch culture. Who knows? But the Van de Velds took a look around and they said, you know, if I have to paint one more tulip, I'm going to scream. So we're out of here. And they went to work for Charles. Um, <clears throat> and Van de Velde, the elder, epitomized a certain kind of uh, marine artist, and that is a son of a ship captain. He came from the sea. He wasn't necessarily an artist who, who learned his craft and then began to paint marine subjects. Quite the opposite, actually. And so Charles sent him out to document these uh, battles that were going on between uh, England and Holland and France also. Um, and uh, Van de Velde the Elder made thousands of these drawings. And for many of these ships, these are the only uh, visual representation we have for a lot of these ships. So they're, they're documentary uh, uh, pieces of evidence too. Uh, 
his son, he painted, but then his son would often take uh, his old man's drawings. And he went out with the fleet, ducking, you know, when cannonballs uh, flew over his head and made these drawings on the spot. And so his son would take them and make, make much more sophisticated uh, paintings in that high Dutch realist style. But now living in, in England, at, in the court of King Charles. Uh, real problem with the Vandevelds, and here's another example. It looks a lot like that earlier, Jan Porcellus, a ship in the big ocean, uh, you know, dark, darks and lights, giving you a real feeling of the, the power of nature. The problem with the Vandevelds was <clears throat> they never learned to speak English. So they never had any direct pupils. Uh, and here's a Dutch yacht. I mean, uh, most people consider the, that the Dutch were the first to build boats for pleasure. Um, <clears throat> royalty was. Um, and the word yacht itself comes from a Dutch, a Dutch word. Um, but there was another artist, there was an artist in England named Peter Monami, who was actually a sign painter. Um, <clears throat> and I could see him tooling down the Bond Street one day and seeing a little Van de Velde painting in the window saying, you know, blimey, I can do that. So he started painting and, uh, and very reminiscent of a couple of the earlier paintings we've seen with the ship in nature, et cetera. This is actually another uh, royal yacht, but also adding the element because he was in England uh, of coastal, coastal paintings, not just ships in the open ocean anymore. And that coastal nature of life in and around the coast is a big subject in marine art. And within, and there were another, a couple of other artists that were significant, Brookings and uh, Dominic, Sari, certain guys. But this fella, Samuel Scott, was considered the Dutch Van de Velde. Uh, I mean, the English Van de Velde. Uh, sorry about that. It really <clears throat> took, it, took that style as an Englishman to its highest point. And at the same time in England, Thomas Buttersworth Sr. was painting. Um, mostly battle scenes like this or ships in the open ocean. And it was interesting that uh, his, his work was getting quite well known in the Americas through engravings of paintings, uh, not the actual paintings themselves. But his son or grandson, nobody's really quite sure still, uh, played a pivotal part like the Van de Velts moving the tradition from uh, the Netherlands to Britain in moving the tradition from England to the Americas. He moved to Hoboken, New Jersey in 1845 and uh, began painting what he saw in New York Harbor. There was a lot of yacht racing, a lot of shipping, all sorts of boats, where bridges were built, et cetera. And this is, I, I want to show you this painting because it's a good yacht ra racing painting of his, but it's also the last painting he ever painted. It's just a significant little thing. Um, but, Something else was happening in the world at that time, and that is after the defeat of the French at the Battle of Waterloo, 1815, uh, the end of the East India trade monopoly, 1834, uh, the world entered, the Western world, uh, an era of peace that lasted virtually to World War I. Um, and so instead of building ships full of guns, people were building ships to move cargo uh, quickly, as quickly and efficiently as they could all around the world. Big clipper ships that have given us the image when you say marine art to most people, it's a big clipper ship with all its sails set, pounding across the, the open ocean. Um, and it's really this period of time, this wasn't lost on artists. So uh, artists like Buttersworth, in addition to what he saw, yachting and shipping and stuff, began to paint clipper ship paintings like this. And I. Uh, Buttersworth is a, is a tricky example, but people come to me sometimes after a talk like this and say, you know that Buttersworth, I have that painting. And I know they don't because I know where I took the picture, et cetera. But I also know what happened. And that is, in case of Buttersworth, there's some forgery issues, which uh, one of the people who sent in questions, uh, John uh, Evans, uh, asked about, and this has been a documented thing. But also what happens with an artist is he'll paint a painting. And someone will come and say, gee, Jim, I really like that painting. You say, well, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it's already sold, but I can paint you another one like it. And so it's not surprising, and that happens. And you'll see as we go on, there are artists well known for that. Not surprising that uh, 
sometimes there are more than one painting of it that are very similar. Um, also moving the tradition here a little bit earlier, but to the city of Boston was Robert Salmon. He came to Boston in 1828 and uh, began to paint theatrical sets, did lithography uh, <clears throat> in the early days of lithography, uh, and also painted um, scenes of England, which the uh, uh, Tories and things that were living in Boston found very appealing in their home country. So here we are in Scotland on the River Clyde, and another view of his uh, off Liverpool. And he did something different. He brought us down as if we're standing on the dock, this low level perspective looking out over the harbor. It was a different kind of a way and more intimate way of looking at presenting a marine scene. And here's the epitome of one of his uh, paintings of that, as if you're really right on the dock side. And also this moment almost frozen in time, still, uh, but from him and from Buttersworth, we got our first bona fide American marine artist, Fitz Henry Lane. You see the words you there, until a few years ago, and all the books and all the literature he is referred to as Fitzhugh Lane. Until the authority on this artist who lived in uh, Cape Ann, uh, up the coast uh, from Boston, um, was giving a talk at the Cape Ann Historical Society one day, and it resulted in some of the folks that are doing research. Is they, the paintings had always been signed Fitz H. Lane, and for some reason everybody assumed it was Hugh. Uh, they found a painting in New York that he'd signed with his full name, Fitz Henry Lane. So here we are 150 years later and all the research and all the stuff is turned upside down. But you can see the similarity between the Robert Salmon painting. Down low as if you're right there on, on the water side, still moment, of sort of a moment frozen in time. Uh, looks like there's another one here. Yeah, here's a good example of up near Gloucester, same kind of a thing. The world has just stopped for a moment of stillness and beauty. And then here's Martin Johnson Heed, who was a well-known landscape painter, taking that moment in time to its ultimate thing, just the exact moment when the lightning bolt is striking. Uh, let's see what's next. Frederick Church, who had the big house Olana <clears throat> up on uh, the Hudson River, many people know for his landscapes, did a lot of marine paintings. Albert Beardstadt, well known for his work out in the West, uh, did this painting and other marine paintings, but this is really emblematic of a lifestyle. In other words, these people were inveterate travelers, travelers uh, Victorian artists, and they always had their sketchbook. And so Beardstadt was riding on this uh, side wheeler and it went aground. You know, and so instead of powering up his iPhone to watch uh, the day sporting event, uh, or, you know, call his wife and say, honey, I'm going to be late. He got his sketchbook out, made a sketch and made this painting from it. So it's another little piece of documenting a moment. And of course, <clears throat> arguably our most famous marine uh, artist in America, Winslow Homer, who lived in Maine and uh, his favorite subject was the sea. I mean, he was a, uh, an illustrator. He never had to work as a waiter like a lot of young actors or say, uh, would you like fries with that order to pay the bills? He always had work, <clears throat> working mostly for Harper's Weekly, doing lots of other things, but his love was the sea. And if you went to uh, the exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum, uh, that's probably 15 years ago now, went into the last room of his work and everything in that room were the works he, he worked on for the last 20 years of his life. And they were all paintings of the sea. He lived in Prout's Neck, in fact, you can go visit his uh, studio there through the Portland Museum of Art. And they spent a million and a half dollars restoring his studio recently, which I'm sure would have galled all Winslow home. But, uh, now here's another fella, uh, <clears throat> ship portraiture, which is really the emphasis on the lines of the ship, the details of the ship, not where she was or et cetera. <clears throat> is, a, is a, something peculiar to marine art. And this fellow, Antonio Jacobson, who was a Danish immigrant, and you can read that 
uh, <clears throat> painted between five and 6,000 paintings, often painting the same ship more than once for, if there were four or five owners, they'd commission him to paint. There could be four or five captains in the course of the ship. But he, before telephone books, before the internet, this is how he signed his paintings <clears throat> with his address. So you could find him. <laughs> Pretty commercially oriented guy. Um, and you could actually track his work uh, through his address. He lived early on in Park Avenue, then he moved to Hoboken. Uh, let's see what's next here. Yeah, there's the completed painting. Uh, and that's a typical Jacobson ship portrait. In fact, he did so many paintings. There's, this, there's a book, it's as thick as a telephone book called The Checklist, in which it's just a listing of the paintings he did by ship's names. I can't, it's hard to read, isn't it? New Jersey, et cetera. And as soon as this fellow, his name was Sniffin, who worked for the Mariners Museum in uh, Newport News, announced he was publishing this book, people started coming forward and saying, well, my painting's not in it. So he had to publish one addendum and then another addendum. That's how many paintings uh, Jacobson produced. And then that, after 1900, there's a value issue here that's kind of interesting, and that is before 1900, he worked on his own, worked by himself. He might have had somebody helping him in a sort of menial way, but he got so busy, he had his kids help him after 1900, and the work looks quite different often, but not always, uh, depending on who painted what part of it. Um, and in the marketplace, that is reflected, but this is not that different than. Uh, 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 Raphael painting a great masterpiece <clears throat> in Renaissance Italy and having his apprentices paint everything until he just comes in and paints the eyeball and he says, now Giovanni, go get the check. Uh, so it's, it's something that goes on in the art field. All right, let's keep going here. Then we had James and John Bard, twin brothers, who painted uh, paintings like this so accurate that apparently you could take the lines off this painting and build the ship. And this particular painting, or one of their paintings, <clears throat> was in the book of the Smithsonian's greatest 100 uh, works of American art. It was a marine ship portrait. Very interesting. And then if, if you sailed the world, uh, which many people from our part of the country did as a merchant, you ran into the Rue family in Marseille, France. There were five generations some gals among them who were ship portrait painters. And you had your ship painted invariably by a member of the Rue family. The largest collection of uh, paintings by the Rue family is actually in the Peabody Essex Museum in, uh, in uh, Salem, Massachusetts, not in France. What's next? Ah, Frederick Cousins, okay. Lived on Staten Island. He's the fellow who did all the, the, the 27 prints of American yachts that you see in so many yacht clubs, mostly uh, watercolors. So I take, that's the traditional path of marine art. We've added in a few other things, and then I add in a few more to help us uh, arrive at the variety of work that's being done today. Albert Pinkham Ryder, uh, the Flying Dutchman, you can see the guys barely in there. Uh, Edward Hopper, the guy who gave us the paintings that have uh, uh, caught some attention recently, the night, night hawks, the people sitting in the cafes alone, like everybody feels. But he lived on Cape Cod and uh, did a number of marine paintings. We think he designed this boat, actually. Um, Joseph Turner, some of you went over to the seaport, and maybe many, to see those great watercolors. But <clears throat> his favorite subject was the sea. And, said for this painting, he, they were crossing the channel and a big storm came up. So he said to the, the sailors, I'll say, we're going below. And he said, no, you, you tie me to the mast. And then he, you're a crazy artist, but they did. And they went below, you know, cause he wanted to see what he wanted to see what it was like and feel what it was like to be in the middle of the storm. <clears throat> and they came back up and untied him and he went home and made this painting didn't show you what a storm was. It, show, it makes you feel like you're in the middle of a maelstrom. Uh, Claude Monet, marine painting, absolutely. Known for lots of stuff, but marine subject matter. George Seurat, the guy, the pointillist, and all those little dots. So I, I, I fold all this in to where we, how we got today. Renoir, 
<clears throat> you know, gentle little riverside scene, all part of the marine subject matter today. Eugene Boudin, this little sloop going out of the cut, uh, seen at the beach. We don't dress like that too much anymore, but uh, uh, yes, part of the marine art, art scene. And then for the first 50, no, wrong, 70 years of the 20th century, if you wanted contemporary uh, traditional marine painting, this was your man, Brit, a Brit, Montague Dawson. This is a classic clipper ship painting. But interestingly, he fell right into the tradition of the, the whole beginnings of marine art because he was documenting battles for in World War I and World War II, naval battles for as an official artist for the British Navy. So that element still carries on today. So we've made our way from uh, the Netherlands through Britain to the States, and now we're pushing up into the 20th century. Uh, and really what we're you'll see over the next few minutes is uh, there's the widest and deepest and most varied pool of marine art out there today than at any other time in history. It's pretty astonishing, but it's true. And you'll see, so we're gonna quickly skim over, skim I guess, uh, some of the key people and what makes their work distinctive. So this fellow goes up to John Atwater, goes up to Christmas Cove every year. And uh, <clears throat> some of you know where that is in South Bristol, Maine. And sketches and photographs then he goes back and spent his winter painting paintings but what's interesting about this if you remember the dutch paintings from the 17th century you would never see paintings with these colors in the 17th century so we've already made some changes and here are the uh, couple of lobster guys up in uh, south bristol right near the swing bridge there if you know it and if you want to know what it's like to <clears throat> drop the spinnaker uh, you're not looking for Willard Bond. You want to know what it feels like to have a spinnaker drop over the side, soaking wet. You're going to drag it in. This is your man, just like Turner. Today, <clears throat> down in the Chesapeake, some of you are familiar with these traditional Chesapeake Bay log canoes. They're still sailing today. There's a small fleet, and this artist, Mark Caselli, goes out with them on the weekends and sails. But uh, <clears throat> look at those hiking boards. Really, pretty neat stuff. But he's documenting that fleet for us. And here, of course, you know, at the seaport, there's the sandbagger Annie. And uh, the reason these were called sandbaggers, is you can see the sandbags here closest to us. Uh, and they carried such a disproportionate amount of sail to their uh, draft, et cetera, that every time they tacked, they had to lug those sand, sandbags to, win, to uh, the windward side so they wouldn't go over. Uh, And we're all familiar with these cat boats, but uh, the beautiful luminescent, luminescent uh, way to paint them. And I said, check the water in all these paintings, it's kind of interesting. And then here at the seaport, of course, uh, is a schooner yacht Brilliant, which was given by, uh, whatever his name is, the race car guy, God, I can't remember his name, in the 50s to the seaport. But in the, in the- Briggs Cunningham. Thank you. In, uh, was that David? Yeah, you would know. Um, in 1992, we're going to celebrate the 60th anniversary of, uh, of uh, Brilliance launching. So uh, the Seaport commissioned John McRae to make a painting. So at the, at the helm here, you have Walter Barnum, who, who built, uh, had Brilliant built, and in the companionway, Olin and Rod Stevens. And this is the Shakedown Cruise. And they were still alive in 1992 when uh, this painting was painted. And we're, look, we're looking over John's shoulder. And the only criticism they made, if you see those two vents in the middle, some of you will understand this, uh, which are facing forward. And you say, well, how can that be? Because uh, water will get in there and get down below. And John actually had them facing the other way. And it was either Olin or Rod leaned over to him. And I was there and said, uh, John, that's not correct. Those are Durade vents. They're, they're vents that these guys uh, designed for the yacht to raid, so water could go in and flush out and still and be facing forward. So artists don't always get it right the first time out. Let's see what's next. And John is also emblematic. He died now two years ago. Uh, and of course, his greatest champions 
were here in Stonington Art and uh, Marguerite Reardon uh, for years on Pearl Street. And that's where the world really first saw uh, John's marine paintings over a series of shows over a series of years. But he was more than just a painter. He was interested uh, and passionately devoted to promoting classic yachting and interest in it. So he helped start the Museum of Yachting in Newport with Elizabeth Meyer and also with Elizabeth uh, started the uh, International Yacht Restoration School really specifically to help restore the country's oldest yacht, Coronet, which is up in Newport today. Um, now the school has grown to a place that, and many of you will be familiar with it, they're really training a whole generation of uh, wooden boat builders. The Coronet project's been taken over by a West Coast boat builder, but you can go up there and see um, the ship being worked on and other ship, wooden ships being built. Um, but it was an artist behind a lot of this. Next. Whoops. There we go. Um, <clears throat> some artists, well, let's just put it this way. The advent of paint in a tube is a, is a 20th century invention. Prior to that, artists would actually take the pigments, and in the old days, you'd have an apprentice crush. You know, their job was to crush lapis lazuli for a year <clears throat> to crush it into pigment form, then you'd mix it with a medium oil or whatever you're gonna use. There's an artist still today, Peter Argambo, who gets up every day and says, what colors am I gonna use? How much am I gonna use? And uh, still makes his own paint. It gives his painting a, a totally different feeling, an older kind of a feel. Uh, here we are in uh, New York Yacht Club cruise off Bear Mountain Light. And it's not just painting. Uh, the field is really branched out. And here's, a, I mean, I say a, a ship modeler like this, Rob Napier, who takes care of the ship models for the New York Yacht Club, let's say Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Um, but when he makes a model like this, he starts with a tree and a set of plans. And he'll make every turnbuckle. If it's metal, he'll cast it. Uh, if it's wood, he'll carve it. And using a variety of woods, everything perfectly to scale and detail. And we look at these makers as artists, uh, not just uh, mere craftsmen. Now we take a few look, uh, a look at a few different paintings of the same subject. In this case, the Yacht America. <clears throat> as she left New York City to sail over to contest for the 100 Guinea Cup, now known as the America's Cup, because uh, she won it. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll see how uh, a number of different artists treat the same subject matter. Here's Tom Hoyne. You can see, same ship. It's one of the mysteries of art. Ten artists can paint the same subject, even the same person. <clears throat> and even though their work is totally different, you'll recognize the person, or in this case, the same vessel. Um, it's something that, um, I don't know, it's a characteristic of the field. Here's a British artist, Tim Thompson, who uses layers and layers of very thin glazing to get this luminous uh, feel. And right here in town, Russ Kramer, who's got a studio in Mystic, <clears throat> Here are the guys having won the race, passing uh, the Royal Yacht, uh, Victoria and Albert. Queen Elizabeth is sitting there. I don't know how large you can have it on your thing, but she's actually there. And uh, the crew is saluting her. And the famous line as she turned to one of her guys and said, well, who came in second? And the fellow said, your majesty, there is no second. So setting the tone for... Uh, a couple of centuries of racing here. But the other thing that's interesting is this is pre L.L. Bean or Ellie Hansen, et cetera. So what did you wear when you went yachting? You wore your suit. Because if you wore your blue jeans, you were a workman. You know? um, and here's uh, the leading marine artist in New Zealand, uh, Tony Blake, who captured the America sailing up in, uh, which went up to Newport and then went up uh, actually Bell and Marblehead bought her after the race, but uh, his brother was Sir Peter Blake. Um, and among sailing people, that's like saying uh, 
Michael Jordan to basketball players. Um, but Tony's, Tony has a big 60 foot schooner. He's the head of the Wooden Boat Association in Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, anyways, he's got his own take on, he shows you the round cockpit that's distinctive of America. Also, <clears throat> the subject of yachting is uh, still a popular subject. Uh, even this artist who's a 65 year old artist living in England recreating uh, the great J boat race of 1937. And to do something like this, in this case, there'd be some photographs or he'd get the lines of the boats, uh, old engravings, read whatever accounts he could read of a particular race in order to understand all the technical elements. And then he had to add his uh, artistry to that. Here we are, just a big blow down off, <clears throat> off Bermuda excitement of yacht racing. And it's not just full models, it's half hull models. Here's Shamrock 5, a uh, big J boat. Many of you know was up in Newport uh, for years. Um, uh, and these models, as boat builders know, were built to help uh, design and, and build boats, but now they're being built really as decorative objects. Um, and I'm sure here, at, at Stonington Harbor Yacht Club, there are half models of people's boats on the wall. Um, and there's a half model of a catamaran. So I don't know what you call that, a quarter model, but anyway, even. And here's a really detailed model of a Grand Banks that we did for a guy years ago, right down to, so detailed, right down to his favorite can of beer, which was about a 16 of an inch high in the holder next to the helm. But <clears throat> these are extraordinary artists, really. And if you want to know what it likes to feel, what it feels like to be up in the rigging in a big J boat, um, Russ Kramer could be your man, way, way high up. I mean, the mainsail of a of a uh, big J boat is I, I know, three or four times the size of the mainsail of a twelve meter. Just enormous boats. And here's a famous yacht, Finisterre, Bang Your Way, probably towards Bermuda, designed by a guy named Carlton Mitchell, well-known yachtsman who wanted to prove that, uh, that the centerboard yacht could take on all these keel boys. And he did for years. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, Russ has caught her nose in. Pretty exciting, dramatic feeling of the ship, uh, I mean, the yacht. Let's see. And here is one of the great, and there are two artists painting the same race. One of the, one of the great, great tra transatlantic races ever, 1866. Three guys are sitting in the Union Club in New York. Uh, Osgood, uh, Lorillard, and James Gordon Bennett, the son of the uh, <clears throat> uh, Herald Tribune, uh, and bragging about how fast their 90 foot or they're about uh, schooners were. And they, were, they got pretty liquored up, I guess. And so before the night was over, they'd agreed to race. And they, where do you want to race? To Newport? Nah, it's nothing. Let's race to England. OK. When do you want to do it? I don't care. December. OK. So December 13th, I think it was, they left New York. Great fanfare. Henrietta Fleetwing and Vesta. Henrietta was, was uh, uh, James Gordon Bennett's boats. And because that his family owned the New York Herald Tribune, it was covered in the paper like nobody's business. Uh, when you read the uh, 19th century accounts of sporting events, they're so thorough and long. Uh, it's uh, no television, no radio, et cetera. So as they started, this is by uh, New Zealand artist, uh, Tony Blake. Um, they all started together. And at the end of day one, they were still in sight of each other. Um, and they were driven hard. And matter of fact, James Gordon Bennett hired a professional captain, uh, Samuel Bully Samuels, to drive his boat. Uh, they got in some heavy weather halfway across. Six guys went over the side, and, uh, five or six guys, a fleet wing, and they were gone. That was it. I mean, these guys were racing for real. And they put up 50,000 bucks, the winner take all kind of a thing. So this was serious business. 
they arrived in England within hours of each other. Vesta actually took on an English pilot. They might, they might have won, <clears throat> but the English pilot took them the wrong way. Henrietta uh, finally won. Uh, let's see if we have another picture of it. No, all right. Um, anyway, kind of a cool documentation of that race. So I thought you might find it interesting, just like there's certain people who have a lot of projects going all the time, there's certain artists who are like that too. So if you walk into this young artist, Don Demers, not so young anymore, I guess, um, house, this sketch was about the size of a half a postcard. He's got 50 of these up on his refrigerator or bulletin board. He's always looking at ideas, thinking about ideas. So in this case, you know, it's a pilot ship, uh, it's a pilot boat a approaching a, a big clipper. Um, and he has this idea in his head and someday he'll get to it. So here we are, the first step is to make that pencil sketch. The next step is to make a color sketch, in this case in watercolor, uh, to get the tones and make sure it's the way he wants it. And the final version, he actually decided to change it quite different, to make it quite different. But it's the process of getting to that point I thought you might find interesting. And as many of you know, uh, these pilot boats went as far offshore as 200 miles because whoever got out there first got the job. And, you know, they get their friends drunk in the other pilot boats or mess up their lines on the dock so they couldn't get out as quickly. Um, but the pilot boat, of course, <clears throat> was really the prototype for many yacht designs and needed to get, their, get places quickly and in uh, big weather like this. Let's see what else we've got. All right. And fishing is also a subject. In this case, uh, working a mackerel school. So if you look up on top of the yards of the uh, schooners in the distance, you'll see guys up there. And they're looking for mackerel schools. These days they do it with an airplane. Uh, and then they'll lay out the net that's in this dory, uh, you know, a mile long and pull, all this, pull them all in by hand. Um, but <clears throat> this is a very dramatic composition, that oar coming straight into the picture. And this is how an artist would look at it. Uh, and the artists among you will know that. You know, you take a painting and turn it over. So you get a little disoriented to the subject matter, but what you're focusing on is the abstract elements of the painting to show you whether things are in balance, or in this case, he uses that or as a way to shove your, shove your eye right into the middle of the picture. And fishing is a subject, <clears throat> uh, as I said, this artist, Tom Hoyne, devoted the last 10 years of his life to, uh, to uh, uh, documenting the Gloucester fishing fleet. And I said, you know, if he were a filmmaker, he would have made a film, if he was an author, he would have written a book, uh, but he was a painter. So what he did was he commissioned ship models to be made. He made friends with the last of the old timers who had fished out in uh, <clears throat> this way. And uh, what was the way he'd go out from Gloucester, 150 miles or so, out to George's Bank or the Flemish Cap, bait 200, uh, a line with 200 hooks on it by hand, get in your dory with a dory mate and lower them over the side, wait for some bites and start pulling them in. Real tough, tough guys work. And the, and the most famous, so Tom, he spent, his, as I said, the last 10 years of his life wanted to show us every aspect of this uh, enterprise. I'll tell you a quick story. There's a guy in, uh, in uh, Gloucester named uh, Howard Blackburn who, achieved the fame for a variety of things, but this is what the life was like. So he, they were out fishing, a big storm came up. He couldn't find, uh, they couldn't find the schooner. And so you don't, in those days, you don't call OnStar, you know, you don't have GPS, et cetera, et cetera. I said, what are we gonna do now? He said, well, we're rowing to shore. So in the middle of winter, in the middle of the storm, they start to row. <laughs> His dory mate died two days in, Blackburn realized that his hands were so frozen they wouldn't be able to hold the oars. So he dipped them in the water and put them over the oars and just froze his hands to the oars. So five days later, he arrived in Newfoundland and they uh, <clears throat> uh, had some people took him in. They had to amputate all of his uh, digits on his hands and a great number of his toes. 
So I said, oh, hell. So he went back down to Gloucester. He opened a bar. He was quite a guy, apparently. It was pretty popular. And then he got bored. So he said, ah, I think I'm going to go out, out west to the uh, gold rush. So we got some guys. They fitted out a boat, sailed it around Cape Horn. He got to San Francisco. He, he had a falling out with the guys, came back to Gloucester, and he got bored again. So he built a schooner and sailed it to England by himself with no, no digits. And then he came back and he got bored and he sailed another one to Portugal. Anyway, these were, these were really uh, a different kind of people. You know, they're not sitting in their uh, car saying, I got to turn the heat up on my side, honey. So, uh, and he's showing us here this aspect. Whoever got their, their load of fish first, they called it a trip, and then got into the dock first, got the best price. So he called this paying the widow maker because the boat is full of fish, now driving into port, guys up on the, on the uh, bowsprit furling in the sail, Boat noses into a wave, uh, five guys go down, four guys come up. That was it. They just kept on going. Uh, I have to speed up for you now. <clears throat> Here's the last green ship, but it, this artist shows you what it's like to be on the big rolling Southern Ocean, Chris Blossom. He did a commission for somebody who came to us with a ship's log of the Brig Betsy off uh, California. What's happening here is where the light is, and you can see on one side of the ship, this is a true story, the customs guys are coming aboard there. And on the other side of the ship, those guys are rowing and smuggling stuff in while the other guys are keeping the customs guys uh, busy. I asked Chris to come paint in the gallery one day so people could see uh, a painting from blank canvas to finished painting. Here is the finished painting of Gloucester. But to do a painting like this, he would get the plans of the town, what the buildings were made of, and occasionally he'd disappear uh, for a couple of days. And I'd say, Chris, where, where did you go? He said, I just wanted to see the light and the, it, what it was like. Um, and if you're in Jonesport, Maine, uh, or even out here, you know what it's like to be in a lobster boat in the heavy seas. We're going to speed it up now. Um, some artists do really detailed pencil sketches, unlike the sketch you saw earlier from Don Demers, and actually exact same size of uh, the original painting. So there's no design elements left. It's all done and the rest is color work. And there's wildlife as part of marine art, this cool bronze of a black skimmer feeding, or these emperor penguins, or Bob Lagasse, many of you would have seen him at the old Mystic Carver shows years ago, carving at Honduras mahogany. But, and the one of the largest cast bronzes, look how, look how big it is. It's off the uh, Hard Rock Cafe. It's where the cruise ships come in in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, the artist Ken Olberg was a fascinating guy, but a Swedish Navy SEAL. He hand carved the, these fish out of clay, or manufactured them out of clay, 9,000 pounds of clay that they were cast into bronze. And fish underwater, another subject. All this is part of the marine art scene. This artist, Randy Puckett, has uh, concentrated on sculptures of whales, but more than that, research, supporting research. When you go into the Monterey Bay Aquarium and look up to the ceiling, there are two huge gray whales. He made those. If you see the Pacific Life uh, uh, commercials during the Pacific Life tennis tournament, he made a life-size humpback whale out of bronze, which is breaching up in front of Pacific Life headquarters, California. Or even a half model of a whale. I don't know what you call that. I want to show you a little bit of scrimshaw because it's truly a sailor's art. And that is <clears throat> when the guys were sailing, they... Yeah, most of them were illiterate. There wasn't any TV to watch, any of that kind of stuff. So uh, they take one day of the week when they had a day off, they take the only piece of a whale that didn't have any commercial value, and that's a tooth, which I actually happen to have one from a Finnish ancestor right here. Um, and this is fossilized ivory. You're looking, the one on the right is a, a whale tooth, and the one on the left is fossilized ivory. But I asked our friend Bob Weiss to show us how he makes a piece. So here's a 
equipment he uses from a jeweler's magnifying glass to a jeweler's vice, uh, X-Acto knives, needles, et cetera, ink. We make a little drawing on a piece of transfer paper and transfer it on to the, very faintly onto the uh, uh, piece of ivory. And it's design, you make a design to fit the shape of the piece of ivory. And then take it as an X-Acto knife or needle and incise the lines uh, around it so that he's cut into the ivory. And what he's doing in picture four is rubbing ink and where he's cut into the ivory, it goes into the ivory and stays and it'll rub off the excess ink. And he'll keep doing that over and over and over again. And the shadows and shading in the final piece are just a series of literally hundreds, if not thousands of dots that he dots into the ivory and then rubs the ink and keeps rubbing it off. Unlike the uh, whalers, Bob went to Pratt. He's a trained artist. Uh, uh, so he made a choice as to uh, spend his, his career doing scrimshaw. Uh, I show you this because while the American whalers would go out like Charles W. Morgan for two or three years at a time, Japanese whalers like to sight the whales from shore, <clears throat> get in their boat, go out, harpoon them and be back in time for sushi, All right? So, and this is the kind of boat they would go whaling in. Uh, and I show you this because even boats like this are being painted or in this case modeled uh, for us to have preserved really. Um, as I said, a guy like Chris would find a set of plans to help do a painting of Gloucester. Well, this artist takes it one step further. He actually, he wanted to show the constitution when she was launched. Um, and so he went down on an October day, verified the weather, but he got the plans of the shipyard and before he even started, made that model you see down on the lower right, everything to scale so he could put everything exactly right in perspective. Um, I'm going to speed up now. Uh, so here we are back to that moment, exact moment in time <clears throat> that we saw earlier with Martin Johnson Heed, uh, sort of a spooky painting, but with the uh, lightning bolt coming down. And military uh, paintings are still a part of the scene today. Here's the Missouri on a midshipman cruise in August of 1953, you know, and she would have been configured differently in October. So uh, the guys who paint these paintings have a tremendous amount of knowledge. Uh, and here is uh, one of the Great White Fleet in uh, Yangtze. Another way of using watercolor, quite a bit different. And the Yorktown, which is now a museum in Charleston, South Carolina. And this guy, Tom Freeman, was a big favorite of uh, Ronald Reagan, George Bush's. These paintings hang all over the West Wing. They love the drama and power of his work. And here's a great story of uh, <clears throat> HMS Pickle. This artist, Jeff Hunt, is well known because he did the covers for all the, the American edition of the Patrick O'Brien novels. But he wanted to do a painting, a little side painting from the Battle of Trafalgar. And that is when uh, Lord Nelson was killed uh, on the victory. And, but uh, the English won the uh, battle. They wanted to get the word back to England as quickly as possible. Uh, and none of those big frigates could sail up to the end of the wind or up to the wind. So they chose this little topsail schooner and said, you gotta get back there as quickly as you can and let people know we've won the battle, but our hero is dead. Um, and so uh, captain whose name I can't remember now, drove the ship hard, landed in Cornwall, you know, got on a stagecoach 300 miles to get into the Admiralty at one o'clock to announce that Nelson had been killed. Um, and they still, in the Royal Navy, there's still an HMS Pickle Night dinner every year. Cool painting, though. Uh, and this fellow, Patrick O'Brien, has spent his career, among other things, uh, documenting great sea battles. So all this is still going on today. Bob Sticker giving you a, a look as if you were really in the water in the middle of this battle at a particular moment. And river boats, another part of uh, 
marine art, all life in, on, and around the water. And this was the mm, uh, uh, sinking of the Pendleton that was made into the movie, The Finest Hours, where the big freighter broke in half in the 50s off Cape Cod. 30 guys were on the stern, stuck alive. Four guys went out in the lifeboat, and the, and the fellow who painted this, Morik Sarba, sailed on salvage tugs for years in exactly this kind of situation. He tracked down the one of the, the only surviving Coast Guardsmen who went out and talked to him for hours about what happened actually, <clears throat> what it was like out there, and was able to make this painting uh, uh, very accurately. And there's still artists painting today or at this time that look like 18th century paintings. That's just another part of what's going on. So you're everywhere from the first painting we saw that was bright and colorful to these very subtle, luminous paintings. And John Stobart, who many of you know, uh, as an Englishman, took an Englishman, but he came to uh, the States. I can't tell you the whole story, but came to the States and decided he wanted to show us, let's see what's next. Yeah, what harbors were, our harbors were like. And he ended up doing this for harbors all around the world in the late 19th century. And uh, really, he's well known through his prints and, and videos and books. So here's Greenwich where <clears throat> Cost Cobb, nine, Route 95 goes right over the spot now. But at that time, it was a farming community. And people brought uh, products down, produce down to the riverside. And, put them on schooners and sail them up and down the coast. Somebody wrote a question in, how old is John? What's he up to? I talked to him the other day. He's now 92. He's still painting. He's working on a big painting of New York, not as uh, quickly as he has in the past. In fact, I think we have a Annapolis. Yeah, he had to get a, had to get a helicopter to get, the, <laughs> get this view of Annapolis. And some of you may have seen some of the things. He's done a lot of paintings of lower Manhattan. We did some special prints with the New York Times, but showing us what it was like there. Any town that has, you have to walk under bowsprits to get somewhere, you figure that's a pretty good place to live. And here, we're going to, almost done here. So here's a, the only known plan of New Amsterdam when it ended at, at Wall Street, basically. And the rest of the island of Manhattan was... And this artist has taken that plan the same way that the other artist, Paul Garnett, did, but he, he put it into a movie program. Uh, so he can literally, every building, every street, he can literally walk down any street through this, this computer program, make it snow, make it rain. It's made a series of paintings of lower Manhattan in the, in the 17th century, and he took them over to Holland. He's like a god in, the, in Holland. Um, but here, they're so detailed. I mean, here is, here's Peter Stuyvesant's house. Here's the Dutch church. They're really fascinating uh, stuff uh, and lengths to which an artist will go to make sure that they're accurate. Another view up to Hudson or in California, that distinctive California light. This artist spent his career documenting California maritime history. This is a guy who, who retired as a diesel submarine commander, lived here in uh, New London, and was a Brooklyn boy, so I ended up painting a lot of paintings of Brooklyn. Let's see here. Mm, and some of you may have gone to Bermuda on the Queen of Bermuda. Uh, but li anyway, liners are another subject, the ferry boats we just saw. I'm gonna show you this. A lot of artists these days, as many of you know, are painting outdoors, and Monhegan is a place that many artists have painted, but I just want to show you here is our guy, Neil Hughes, and here's the painting that resulted from his uh, trip. And we were hoping to have uh, two very well-known artists to come this summer here to Stonington and paint the town so you could, for a week, so you could meet them and watch them. It's not going to happen, obviously. But maybe we'll do that next and have a little exhibit afterwards. It'd be kind of fun, but really top people. So. Uh, and just the, the coastal land, the beauty of the coastal landscape, still, whether it's in Europe or it's here, or here's an artist, a friend of this artist's window, you know? Uh, all this stuff, oh yeah, and this fanciful take on the first boat show, which is just clever as hell, right? Uh, 
all this falls under the, the, the aegis of marine art where this is still beautiful day in Maine. Okay, I just wanna close with probably the most extraordinary person, artist we have here. I mean, that ship you're looking at was three and a half inches long. That's a picture that was in the New York Times Magazine about 10 or 15 years ago of Lloyd working on uh, this <clears throat> vessel that was built. This is the Prince peg for peg, plank for plank, like the original vessel. Let's see what's next. Yeah, there you go. Um, when I saw him one time, and he was going to England to measure a royal barge he was building for three months. And I said, Lloyd, are you gonna take any work while you're there? He, said, he pulled out a matchbox. And that was three months worth of work because if the wheel on the ship was made of five pieces, he made it of five pieces. He extrudes wire, to make his own rigging so it'll never disintegrate. Extraordinary stuff. So uh, all the pieces are not, are not glued together, they're pegged together so they'll never fall apart. He's had to invent a lot of his own tools to do his, to do his work. And how do you peg a <laughs> ship that's three and a half inches long? That's how you do it. So he, when they, the first restoration of the Morgan was taking place, late 80s, I'd say, he moved to town so that he could go down below uh, when the guys were working and get firsthand information. And just like the other artist, Tom Hoyne, who I said if he was a movie guy, would have made a movie or written a book. So Lloyd's model of the Charles W. Morgan, and look at all those intricate, tiny pieces contains accurate information about the way she was built that guys were discovering uh, the shipwrights as they were working on her. And there's the final. Uh, and he, this is a ship modeler's convention. You leave one side open, A, so you know it's not just a solid piece of wood, but also so you can see what it looked like uh, down below. I mean, this, when I show this on a slide screen, it's six feet long. Now here on everybody's screen, it's probably pretty much close to its actual size. Oh, yeah, here's another one of his models. It looks like it's sailing. I mean, let's face it. The sails are made of paper that he's painted just so. The wood is, the sea is uh, carved of wood and painted. All right, so we're almost done. So <laughs> I, here, here we are, here's our gallery. I'm happy to be back in town. Many of you know I ran the gallery at the, Mystic Seaport in the 80s and 90s, and then moved down to Fairfield, Connecticut. And uh, some of you knew my wife, Patricia Warfield, who had a workshop here and taught uh, art to adults and children. Um, so I'm back in town. I invite you to come visit us. These days, it's going to be by appointment. Let's see what's next. But we have about 800 works of art, carvings, all sorts of stuff here. What else we got? Oh yeah. So by now, if we if it, we start at five o'clock, your swamp Yankee bluefish dinner would be ready. It was time to start that. But I say as we sail off into the sunset, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, join me here on this little journey and heed the advice of these great Americans and by America.